Uh, so good afternoon, uh, everyone attending, and uh, we're just waiting for uh, the full waiting room to, uh, to arrive. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Brian Spears, the president of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, and it's my pleasure to bring uh, a few opening remarks to the delegates attending this afternoon. Uh, we're, well, we, I am certainly very much looking forward to the second um, in a short series of discussions about the, uh, the Privy Council and its cases. And if the first in this series was anything to go by, a very erudite afternoon of analysis and discussion on the wide range of case law uh, developed in the Privy Council. Of course, you will know that the Privy Council is the, is the last court of appeal for uh, a number of um, Commonwealth jurisdictions. And our chair for the presentation this afternoon is a former Supreme Court judge in the United Kingdom. Uh, and of course, a judge who participated uh, uh, very frequently in Privy Council cases. Uh, he will introduce uh, himself better than I have done, and will introduce our panel, uh, who I'm looking forward very much to hear. Uh, as I said the last time, the Privy Council is not um, just relevant to those jurisdictions where it is the final court. Uh, the jurisprudence that has developed is not confined to those specific jurisdictions, and the breadth of considerations uh, within Privy Council decision-making extends beyond human rights and crime into civil uh, and commercial matters and constitutional matters, which in, in my view are of wide, um, uh, wide significance and wide relevance across uh, the Commonwealth. So I look forward to the cases that are uh, going to be discussed and illustrated uh, and unraveled for us this afternoon. I bring uh, a greeting from the Commonwealth Lawyers Association and thank you all for attending. And uh, without any further ado at all, I hand over to uh, Lord Carnwath, who is going to chair our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And I'm pleased to be chairing this session, second of our sessions, with um, two distinguished speakers, um, Richard Clayton QC and Rowan Pennington Benton, talking about five cases they've selected. This time the emphasis is on, is on commercial cases, and the Privy Council, of course, deals with a lot of such cases. Indeed, increasingly, its workload seems to be involved commercial type of cases. Um, two of them were cases in which I was involved personally when I was still at the Privy Council, and the first one was one in which I wrote the lead judgment, so I'll be interested to hear what is said about them, and I may add a comment or two of my own. We've got an hour in all, which means we've got about 10 minutes per case. Um, they may or may not take that time. There's an opportunity, as been said, for questions and answers, but I think it's best if we take those at the end of the session, but by all means add them to the question and answer box in your, on your file. So I, the, I hope you will have been sent or been given a list of the, the five cases that we're going to be discussing. Um, and we, we start off with a case called Mohammed v. Gomez, um, reported in Property and Compensation Reports for 2021, um, which raises interesting questions about proprietary estoppel. So I'll hand over to Richard Clayton to start us off with that one. Thank you very much um, for that. Uh, I hope you find the note that's been produced gives you a summary of some of the issues that we're going to cover. Um, Mohammed and Gomez uh, is a case concerning adverse possession and equitable interests in properties built on someone else's land. These issues commonly arise, particularly in the Caribbean, 
and the decision addresses proprietary estoppel and indicates that fine distinctions between different categories, um, uh, for example, oral assurances, conduct, acquiescence, and assurance. Um, the factual position is this, the parties were all related and knew one another well. They all lived on a 10 acre plot of land owned by the appellant. The respondents all occupied their respective plots since before 1969, when the land was acquired by the appellant's father. The appellant acquired ownership in 2012. The respondents claimed to have entered into possession under an agreement with the father's predecessor in title that they would clear the land, pay rent, and have a right to buy at market value assessed at the date of the agreement. They did in fact clear the land and spent substantial sums of money building, expanding, and maintaining their homes. And they continued to pay rent until 2011, after which time the appellant declined to accept further payment and then tried to recover possession. I want to focus on the board's approach to proprietary estoppel where the board held they had no reason to question the Court of Appeals decision, this is a Trinidad case, to allow the issue of acquiescence by the respondent's father and by the respondent him, uh, in, in, in the appellant's belief that there was a, there, there had been a, there, in the permanence and security of their tenure. So I think I've got that the wrong way around because I've just recited what the, what the approach of the Court of Appeal. This was an appeal uh, from the Court of Appeals decision um, where basically what's ha happened here was the Court of Appeal decided that a, a second line of argument was open um, to be argued before uh, the Privy Council. Um, they decided uh, that all happened because the Court of Appeal in Trinidad reversed the judges on findings of fact because of a misdirection the judge had made about whether the Rent Restriction Act applied Basically, what happened before the trial judge was she had introduced this into the plot at a late stage, um, and um, it really didn't uh, it help in terms of the underlying issues. So the Court of Appeal considered that an alternative case based on a stopper by acquiescence was open um, on the pleadings, and that in their statutory and family context, there was sufficient material to support a finding of proprietary estoppel. The, uh, the, 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 the party that lost uh, appealed to the Privy Council um, and, and during the course of um, his judgment, Lord Conworth gave particularly careful uh, consideration of a number of judgments of Lord Walker um, and in particular to a judgment of Lord Walker um, in um, a House of Lords case, Thorner and Major, uh, which is 2009 one weekly's uh, page 776. Uh, Lord Walker, in the course of his um, speech, uh, observed that there was general agreement about what the essential ingredients were of proprietary estoppel, a representation or assurance made to the claimant, reliance on it by a claimant, and detriment to the claimant in consequence of his reasonable reliance. Um, the question that um, taxed Lord Walker and is discussed by the board was how clear does the relevant assurance have to be in order to uh, give rise to an actionable proprietary estoppel. And what Lord Walker decided uh, was that to establish proprietary estoppel, the relevant assurance must be, quote, clear enough. Uh, not He accepted that was a rather question begging approach, but he said it's hugely dependent on the context. So different cases uh, will result in different approaches. Uh, Lord Calmworth in his, his judgment uh, doubted how, useful, how far it was possible or useful in the context of proprietary estoppel to draw fine distinctions between different char character categories of estoppel. Although there certainly appears to be a lively academic debate about that, but it is so often the way uh, that didn't really um, enhance the issues which the court had to decide. Um, Lord Walker had in his earlier judgments made clear that once one moved beyond claims based on specific contractual rights, there is no clear division to be made between the nature and quality of an alleged verbal assurance and the conduct of the parties in response. In fact, in the factual context, acquiescence could be seen as one aspect of assurance. Uh, he therefore concluded that 
um, on the material before the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal were entitled to be satisfied that the uh, respondents had successfully established the evidential and legal requirements of proprietary estoppel by acquiescence, and that was his conclusion. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you, Richard. That's, uh, I mean, it's an interesting application of the doctrine of, of proprietary estoppel. And I, I confess, uh, when I was preparing the judgment, I was quite surprised to find how far the law had really been developed by Robert Walker, first in the Court of Appeal, um, in a case called Gillette and Holt, which actually was a case in which I was, I was a trial judge and I was reversed because I hadn't realized that Estoppel was as flexible as it became. And one then finds it being developed through the cases so that actually it's a, it's a very flexible way of doing justice in a case where there's been clear acquiescence and an understanding of what the rights were gonna be uh, in a quite an informal situation. In this case, the parties all knew each other and you can, that can be converted into enforceable rights. Um, it can be of particular interest in some of the Caribbean jurisdictions where land titles may have developed in a fairly informal way. And then one finds sort of years later, someone trying to take a sort of rather harsher line and the law I think there was able to show that it could be uh, adapted to deal with the realities on the ground. So I think that is, is an unusual case and quite an important one. Um, right, on that, thank you for that, Richard. If anyone has any questions, we'll put them in the Q&A. We'll move on to the second one, which is Broad Idea International and Convoy Collateral. Rowan, over to you. Thank you very much, Lord Carmouth. Um, so yes, Broad Idea International and Convoy, case from the British Virgin Islands, uh, 2021. UKPC 24, 4th of October this year, fresh, hot off the press. I'm going to avoid talking too much about the facts because frankly, uh, it, this is one of those cases where it really doesn't matter. What does matter here is um, a really fundamental and important review of the principles underpinning freezing orders. Freezing injunctions, as many of our listeners will know, of course, are usually sought in aid of proceedings effectively to freeze the assets of a would-be defendant so that the judgment of the claimant that he or she eventually gets isn't rendered um, pointless. So ultimately it's about preserving the status quo in terms of assets so that a prospective judgment actually has some teeth a common difficulty, however, um, well, I don't know how common it is, but it certainly comes up to come up in my practice, is what do you do? Uh, and I give the example here as representing an insurance underwriter. And the cover holder has to account to the underwriter at the end of the insurance year. Halfway through the year, the underwriter gets hold of evidence that shows prima facie dissipation of assets. In other words, the, the cover holders be busy squirreling away assets, but the money isn't contractually due until six months or nine months later. On the current state of play, the starting position of the courts is, well, look, unless you have a current cause of action now, you can't have your freezing injunction unless it's a Chabra a, a, a case where somebody's holding money for a proposed defendant. So when you go along to court, you say, right, I'll have my freezing injunction. The first thing the court says is, well, where's your claim? Either you have to have it filed then, or you have to have it filed within five days. Um, there's some scope for uh, relying on the doctrine of anticipatory breach in circumstances like that. But depending on the timings, there is something of a gap there in the law. This case, I think, fills it. The uh, claimant in that case, Convoy Collateral, applied in the BVI courts for a freezing order in support of, in aid of proceedings in a foreign jurisdiction, Hong Kong, against a defendant that was within the jurisdiction, within the BVI. So there was, there was a procedural issue about whether um, it was entitled to do that in principle under the BVI rules. We can part that because the rules 
in the UK do actually uh, uh, provide for that, and they do now in the BVI as well. So that issue is sort of gone. The, the, the more important uh, point here is, is there scope for an injunction to be granted when there isn't at that particular time a cause of action? Lord Leggett, giving the majority judgment, says yes. He provided a very uh, a clear and comprehensive review of all of the authorities in this area and rejected the old view that an injunction was necessarily ancillary to an existing cause of action. That's, of course, its genesis, but things have moved on. The litmus test now for an injunction, a freezing injunction should be granted, was what he referred to as the enforcement principle. It is the principle that a freezing injunction, I'm quoting here from paragraph 85, is to facilitate the enforcement of a judgment or order for the payment of a sum of money by preventing assets against which a judgment could potentially be enforced from being dealt with in such a way that insufficient assets are available to meet the judgment. There is no reason in principle, his lordship says, to link the injunction to an existing cause of action. But I do need to just throw uh, uh, some caution in there. This is obviously a legal remedy in a legal context. So what you do need, a good arguable case of dissipation, a real risk that without an injunction, in other words, the defendant, the respondent will put assets out of reach. But also, whilst proceedings do not already have to have been uh, issued, the right to, to bring proceedings even does not yet have to have arisen. However, it is enough that the right will arise and the proceedings will be brought and that those proceedings when they are all carry with it a reasonable prospect of success. So in my scenario that I posited at the beginning, you're not completely out of the woods, because you still have to say, well, look, here is a legal claim that I am going to make in due course when this money isn't paid. And you have to show reasonable grounds that um, the money won't be paid. But it does just fill in that gap now, because you don't need to be running off straight away to court filing your claim there and then, as long as you can convince the judge that nonetheless there's a good reason for the injunction. So hopefully that's an important uh, case and fills in a bit of a sort of procedural gap in the law. End of story. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. That's very clear and actually uh, sounds like a very common sense result. Yes. But as you say, it was some an area of the law which wasn't entirely clear, and so it's good that that's now been sorted out. Um, now, then we move on to uh, number three, which is Charles Lawrence and Intercommercial Bank. Another recent case. Over to you, Richard. Thank you. Well, this is uh, well, I'm talking now about a case which is a, a tortious case about loss. Um, and it's, Rowan is going to follow on with another case about damages uh, of a very different character. Um, a, it's worth emphasizing that what's interesting about this case, another case from Trinidad, is that the appeal succeeded principally on the basis that there were two very recent and very important decisions of the Supreme Court. And on the basis of those, the reasoning of the Supreme Court, the uh, the, 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 the uh, loss was significantly um, cut back and it just demonstrates something which um, uh, one has to have an eye on um, is that the domestic law of the United Kingdom may change and that obviously may benefit people who are not uh, lawyers within the United Kingdom. So this case, uh, Charles Lawrence concerned loss recoverable by a lender as a result of a valuer's negligent valuation. Um, the Privy Council discussed the development and modern understanding which had arisen um, from um, an older case, South Australia Asset Management Corporation and Young Montague Limited, where Lord Hoffman had expressed a view um, and laid down that a valuer is not liable in the tort of negligence or in contract for the loss caused by the valuer's negligence that falls outside the valuer's duty of care. And the importance of the two new cases, Supreme Court cases, is that they refined and developed what is meant by the scope of duty principle or the SAMCO uh, 
principle, to use the uh, acronym for Lord Hoffman's uh, decision. And that was recently explained and discussed by the Supreme Court in the Manchester Building Society in Grand case, and in Meadows and Kahn in the context of a, a claim against an auditor on the one hand and an adopter on the other. In this case, there was an interesting twist, the case of Lawrence, because um, on the usual facts, uh, because what had happened is the, the guarantor had no legal title to the land at all, which was mortgaged. So the land was of no value and the security was worthless. And the, the board had to grapple with where that took everyone. The lender had recovered um, substantial damages when settling a claim against their attorneys for negligence in relation to the guarantor's defective title. Um, and in assessing damages for the negligent valuation, the central question the board asked was how precisely the scope of duty applied on these or somewhat unusual facts. The central submission of counsel uh, for Lawrence was that the court of appeal decision and indeed of the trial judge were incorrect because in law because they were contrary to the recent two recent uh, approaches of the Supreme Court uh, to the scope of duty principle um, that Lord Hoffman established. Essentially, the counsel for Lawrence argued that the loss of the bank sustained should properly be split into two different and distinct types of losses. The first loss arose because the land was overvalued as being for commercial use rather than the residential use. And that's on the assumption that there was a good title to the land that had passed. Secondly, that there was loss sustained because the titles of the land was in fact defective. And what was argued before the board was the second loss was outside the scope of Lawrence's duty of care and therefore irrecoverable because it was not the part of, the part of the job of the attorney to investigate the title to the land. That was the job of a conveyancing attorney. The board agreed with that submission um, and in particular emphasized that the question one has to always ask when looking at this question of issue of damages is the purpose of the advice or information being given, which has to be ju judged objectively by reference to the purpose for which it, it was given. The board therefore ruled that the total loss factually caused by the bank um, was not the correct approach because some of it was outside the, the duty of care of the attorney because it was attributable to the defect in the title rather than the overvaluation. So the distinction here being made is the attorneys were liable for the overvaluation, but not for the, de de the defect in title. And um, so they concluded, uh, mm -hmm. or really concluded that the damages had to be awarded by reference only to the uh, the, the, the loss, uh, the incorrect way of valuing the purpose of the property. So the starting point was a loan was made for three million pounds and deducting the actual residential value at the time the loan was made, assuming it was good title, that was 2.375, uh, 2, 2, 375,000. So you can see that you end up with a rather smaller loss, $750,000. Um, than you would do if you had included damages for um, the uh, defect in title. Um, in the course of the judgment, it's a judgment I should have said of Lord Burroughs and Lady Rose. Uh, Lady Rose, of course, is our most recent appointment to the Supreme Court and Privy Council. Um, the board took the view, or rather the, 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 the justices who decided the case, that um, there were analogies to be made with the Meadows and Kahn Supreme Court case where it was said a defendant, the doctor, had breached her duty of care to a, to a patient because she indicated to the patient she was not a carrier of a, hemoph a hemophilia gene. The claimant had approached a GP, a general practitioner, um, for the specific purpose of ascertaining whether or not she was a character of the hemophilia gene. This is in the Supreme Court case and what that would mean for her pregnancy. She gave birth to a child who very sadly, not only suffered from hemophilia, but also from autism. The defendant accepted it was reasonably foreseeable that the claimant would give rise, give, give, have, give birth, have a birth of the baby that suffered from autism as well as hemophilia. 
However, uh, the Supreme Court held that while the losses for hemophilia were within the scope of the, of the GP's duty of care, the extra loss attributable to autism was not. It was outside the defendant's duty of care and therefore irrecoverable because the purpose of going to the GP was to advise or inform the claimant about the births, risks of giving birth to a ch child with hemophilia. It was not the purpose was not to ascertain the general risks of pregnancy, which included the risk of autism. So um, that I think is quite an interesting example um, of how uh, the, the, the new approach of the Supreme Court has cut back on losses in this field. It's also of interest because um, of the way the Supreme Court approached the counterfactuals, uh, which is discussed by Lord Halfman, um, and indeed, uh, the approach that the board took in this particular case. Um, what they, they asked themselves this question, had the Lawrence valuation of $15 million been correct, uh, the bank would still have entered into the loan, taking the mortgage of the land as security, but it would not have suffered the same loss because the land was worth, would have been worth 15 million only on the basis there was no uh, defect in title and the bank therefore had adequate security. And what they, the board emphasized, and this is quite an interesting extension of the principles which the Supreme Court decided, that it merely reinforced the point made by the Supreme Court that the, the counterfactual championed by Lord Hoffman is uh, less important uh, as, as establishing the scope of the duty uh, and is a helpful cross-check in only some but not all cases. And this was a case where it wasn't helpful to have a counterfactual because here it was easy to differentiate between um, an obligation to provide uh, advice uh, which the attorney had to give and advice about title which the attorney did not have to give was not within the scope of the duty of his duty of care. Thank you. I hope that's helpful and clear. Yes, thank you, Richard. Um, there's a question being raised in the chat about whether we're dealing with the duty of scope of the duty of care of the value or of the attorney um as i understand we're talking about the valuer's duty of care yeah yeah so you're that's correct yeah yes there's, so there's the, two there's two cases in the supreme court there wasn't there yes oh, there, there, there's one medical negligence one and then one which is a valuation and then, and then there's the second point and then the oddly enough it's the doctor's case which is the more important um, in fact, uh, and they were the, the point about the Supreme Court judgments is they were both given or delivered on the same day and they both cross refer to one another. Mm -hmm. So if you're if it's an issue of some importance, it's really quite worth reading those two cases together as well, I think, as the as, as the um, Lawrence case itself, which adds as as as, as the uh, judgments say a, a new and different twist to the approach um, that the uh, Supreme Court have adopted. Yes. So I think you've got Charles Lawrence case is the um, <clears throat> value, which is the classic Sanko case, as though you say is a twist on it. But then the Grant Thornton one is an auditor. Yeah. And as you say, then Meadows is the uh, uh, doctor. Yes. yes. Right. I've got Thank it. <laughs> Good. Good. All right. Well, uh, uh, on that base, we'll then move on to Rowan to your next case, which is Primeo Fund. The Bank of Bermuda, Cayman Limited, uh, which is dealing again with this question of loss for tort. So over to you. Yes, thank you very much. So, um, trying try, try a bit complicated actually trying to get these into my 10 minutes, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. So, I'm really talking about two cases here. Um, the, the first is the Supreme Court uh, decision in a case called Seviaja. S E V I double -L, L E J A, Seviaja and Marix, 2021 A C appeal cases 39. And then the follow on effectively to that judgment, which dealt with reflective loss in the uh, Privy Council Crimeo Fund case, 2021 um, Privy Council cases 22. So the starting point is these cases are all dealing with the supposed bar on the recovery of reflective loss. Um, it's a company law principle 
It's effectively developed in a number of early cases, but came together in a 1982 Court of Appeal case called Prudential and Newman. Many of our listeners, of course, will be familiar with it, but in essence, um, suppose a shareholder of a company and the company itself are both owed duties by a third party, suppose, for example, as a service provider under a contract to which both the company and the shareholder are a party. Suppose, uh, or it could be taught, um, uh, a wrongdoer of some kind owed a duty of care at common law. Suppose there is that breach of duty and therefore in principle, both the shareholder and the company could sue. The rule against uh, recovery of reflective loss is to the effect that the shareholder's loss is really felt in a diminution in value of his or her shares because of damage done to the company. And therefore, effectively, when one invests in a company, takes shares in a company, one throws one's lot in with that company and one's uh, fortunes fall or rise with it. And therefore, the rule is that it is the company that must bring an action for the recovery of those losses. Some of you would have heard my um, 10 month year old son just adding to my um, um, monologue on this. <laughs> Apologies um, about that. So um, um, we then, um, that can have another practical problems and can cause unfairness. For example, do all of the shareholders agree that the company should bring the action? If the company is insolvent, you then have to appoint a liquidator and pay the liquidator money to bring the action. But nonetheless, it's a very long-standing uh, rule, effectively linked to the rule in Foss and Harbottle about independent uh, juridical status of a company vis-a-vis -vis its members. So that's, that's the reflective loss principle. The area was fully reviewed by a seven panel uh, uh, um, court in the UK Supreme Court decision of Sevilla and Marex. I've given the uh, citation for that already. The facts of this case were in fact that the um, claimant was a creditor. So the claimant had secured a court judgment for a money judgment against two companies based in the BVI. Um, the owner, I think also the director of those two companies in the BVI effectively, in order to avoid the companies having to pay that judgment, strip those companies of its assets. Effectively dissipate the capital, you know, sideways dividends into another company, so on and so forth, so that they were not good for the money. And um, Mr. Sevilla said, well, look, assuming I've got a cause of action, um, I think he was uh, some sort of economic tort, uh, procuring or inducing those two companies to violate Mr. Sevilla's rights under the uh, judgment, self the developing area of law. But assuming he had a cause of action, um, the, 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 the um, Court of Appeal was asked, well, look, is it barred by the rule against uh, reflective loss? And that issue eventually came up to the Supreme Court because after all, it's really the BVI companies that have lost the money. It's the BVI companies that have been damaged by the defendant's actions. And therefore, on one view, um, Mr. Sebi Edger should be um, talking to the liquidator of those two BVI companies and getting him to issue claims to breach of fiduciary duty or whatever to re to realise the assets of, of, of the BVI company so that they can pay his judgment. Well, um, and on the basis of certain uh, past decisions, that was a viable uh, position for those, uh, for, for the owner of those BVI companies to take. Anyway, UK Supreme Court says, no, you have to keep the reflective loss principle within strict confines. It is not right that it is, as it's been treated in some authorities, it is not right that it is a rule of procedure. It is not right that it is justified purely on the basis to avoid double recovery. The difficulty being, of course, that Mr. Sevier might succeed against the owner of those two companies in his tort claim, but the two companies might also 
uh, succeed in the claim against the owner for breach of fiduciary duty, there'd be double recovery. The UK Supreme Court said that doesn't matter because you can deal with that by way of case management directions and evidence you can avoid double recovery. It is simply a rule that applies to shareholders because of their relationship to companies. Therefore, Mr. Sabiegi was not caught by the rule because he was not a shareholder of the two BBI companies. He was simply a third party creditor. So that's an important narrowing, first of all, and an explanation of the true juridical purpose and foundation of the rule against uh, reflective loss. We can then see how that is applied and the results, very positive results actually, that development in the law has seen in the case of uh, Premio Fund. I have to, I've simplified the facts slightly because um, of time, but also just to sort of make the general point. We don't need to go into the facts in massive detail, but basically Premio, Premio is an open-ended investment fund. People can come along, buy shares in that fund, and the value of those shares is assessed by reference to what the fund onward invests in. The onward investment of Premio Fund in this case, somewhat unfortunately, was the Bernie Madoff uh, LLC in America, which of course um, turned out to be a, a very famous Ponzi scheme. So there was no pot, as it, as it were, at the end of the rainbow in terms of particular uh, billions of pounds invested by Premio Fund. So Premio Fund started to look elsewhere. And one of the claims that it intimated was against its administrator with respondents to the appeal here, the administrator and the custodian of the fund. So the allegation was that the administrator and custodian of Premio Fund were negligent in not noticing and seeing a warning signs that the Bernie Madoff structure was in fact a Ponzi scheme. The difficulty is, <laughs> up until 2007, Premio Fund had directly invested the funds in, uh, with, with, with the Bernie Madoff scheme in America. So far, so no, pro no, no problem. However, after 2007, it had restructured its investment portfolio such that the investment now took place through an intermediary company. So in other words, Premio Fund would purchase shares in an intermediary called Herald, which would in turn hold the shares in uh, the Bernie Madoff structure in America. And of course, this raised immediately the difficulty by the time this case came to trial of the application of the rule against reflective loss. Could Premio Fund say, well, look, we want to claim the money that was directly invested in, in up until 2007, the other side and the Court of Appeal agreed, said, well, you can't because the position now is that you hold your investment through the company and your real loss is the loss in value of the shares of Herald. So it's Herald that has to bring the claim. Right, Privy Council says no, overturns the Court of Appeal decision. Very clear emphasis on the fact that the rule is one of substance. It is not a rule against double recovery. So the fact that Herald might have a claim against Bernie Madoff and Premio Fund might have a claim against Bernie Madoff doesn't matter. That could be dealt with by way of case management directions just to ensure there isn't double recovery. Um, it is a rule restricted to shareholders vis-a-vis -vis the company of which they are a member and therefore the restructuring in 2007 did not defeat uh, Premio Fund's pre-existing rights as a direct investor in the Bernie Mad uh, Madoff structure. It was still entitled to issue a claim in respect of those losses, which all came into existence prior to the 2007 restructuring. And the question of overlap in terms of the post 2007 restructuring was a matter that de de dealt with by way of quantum and submissions. So um, I realize it's a bit slightly sort of complex subject to sum up in 10 minutes, but effectively I think the headline points are, rule against reflective loss is narrowed. It only applies in respect to shareholders. Um, and, and, and even if there has been restructuring, you can still claim your initial losses of any direct investment. 
um, but it is still a very complicated issue that needs to be looked at very carefully in each case. But uh, certainly, I think there's been some clarification in this area of, of, of importance too. Thank All right. You. Well, thank you, Rowan. That was quite quite tricky stuff. Uh, and actually, it's it interesting how the Privy Council has found itself, even in my time, dealing with a number of cases of fallout from the uh, Ponzi scheme. People yes. seem to have invested money through the BBI and other Caribbean countries in those schemes. And one finds the law, having the common law, having to be carefully sort of managed in order to deal with these rather unusual situations. That's a very interesting example. Thank you. Um, so um, we move on then to our fifth and last case, uh, which is about Central Bank of Ecuador and Contecor. And again, a, a case in which I was involved, although I didn't, in this case, write the lead judgment, but I agreed with it. So we'll see what Richard has to say about that. Over to you, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, this case is slightly older than some of the other cases that we refer to. It it's, remains an important case. It's regularly cited, particularly on the question of concurrent findings of fact, but it also uh, contains a very learned um, treatment by Lord Mance um, about um, dishonest assistance and breaches of fiduciary duty. The case arose because the fourth plaintiff, a company incorporated and based in the Bahamas, brought an action in the Bahamas against the defendant, which was an Ecuadorian company, and three individuals, its principal shareholders and officers. The plaintiff alleged that the defendant had dishonestly procured or assisted uh, its nominee directors to commit breaches of his fiduciary duty by, by causing it on the instruction of those three individuals uh, to operate without any independent judgment as to the company's best interest to enter into three transactions with a defendant company to transfer it as loans and shares to return the global repository receipts, which were subsequently proved to be valueless. The trial judge had conducted a detailed investigation of the facts, and although uh, finding that the, uh, the plaintiff's nominee director had acted in breach of the duty, accepted the probity of the transactions and dismissed the claim that had been brought. The uh, plaintiff then appealed to the Court of Appeal of Bahamas, which rejected the judge's findings in respect of the nominee director, but affirmed his conclusion. So sadly for the claimant, they'd gone backwards rather than forwards. Uh, unsurprisingly, perhaps the plaintiff appealed to the uh, Privy Council. Um, Lord Mance, in a, in a lengthy but uh, very well uh, researched and thought out judgment, uh, of course, as you will know, he's retired now, um, based his conclusions on English law, that a director had to act in good faith, positively applying his mind to what was in the best interest of the company, exercising independent judgment and not fettering his discretion. He went on to hold that a nominee director was in no different a position. In this particular case, the nominee director did nothing uh, material except comply with the defendant's instructions. He didn't, it didn't matter that he wasn't paid very much or that he was nominee of many other international companies, which was the usual practice of the Bahamas. Basically, he didn't do uh, anything independent. Uh, the board decided that the Court of Appeals conclusion couldn't be supported because it was a nominee's director's duty to understand the plaintiff's affairs and to apply his own mind to the interests of the company. The question that then arose was, we're in the territory here of factual findings and the doctrine of um, what the board call concurrent findings of pure fact. Uh, and the approach they took in, in this case is important because it runs as an exception to the general rule that the, the, the Privy Council is very reluctant to uh, overturn findings of fact um, from by, by, by a trial judge or indeed, um, yeah, from the trial judge. Uh, so they emphasize that as a matter of settled practice, said Lord Mans, uh, 
the court would decline to interfere with concurrent findings of fact, except in very limited circumstances. And that, that has been the law since a, 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 a case as long ago as 1946, Devi and Roy. Uh, he emphasized that an appeal court must be extremely cautious about upsetting a conclusion of primary fact because very careful consideration must be given to the weight that a judge attaches in, the fun, in making his factual findings and in particular, any advantage he or she might have as a trial judge over any other appellate court. Um, the appellate court may take the view that without hearing a witness, it is not in a position to come to any satisfactory conclusion just on printed evidence alone. However, in this particular case was exceptional uh, because it fell outside ordinary principles. Um, basically, the court decided that it did have um, the opportunity uh, to look carefully at the factual findings and conclude that the Bahamian courts had simply got it wrong. So the board um, conducted its own very detailed and close analysis of the transactions, concluded that the defendants were both jointly and severally liable for dishonestly procuring or assisting the nominee directors breaches of fiduciary duty in entering the various transactions and that the plaintiff was entitled to recover from the defendant the face value of the loans and shares which had been transferred. So the case is interesting really from two, two points of view. Uh, first, uh, the legal analysis which is a, 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 a very uh, clear and carefully thought through and then also just on a more mundane but important level of it being one of those rare beasts, a case where uh, the court, the, the board felt it was appropriate to overturn um, the findings of fact made by uh, the, the courts below. Thank you very much. Yes, well, thank you, uh, Richard. I think um, you know, my, I recall that case being uh, quite an unusual one. Uh, and a feature of it was actually that the case had nothing to do with the Bahamas. It came up through the Bahamas court because one of the companies, holding companies was based there. But it was really all about the banking system of Ecuador. And it in fact was quite a contentious case in, in, in Ecuador and quite significant economically. And it's quite interesting to see how increasingly the, the, the Privy Council finds itself drawn into these disputes relating to jurisdictions which have nothing to do directly with the country concerned because of the, the, the it, for whatever reason, is thought useful to have a holding company in Bahamas or the BVI, whatever it may be. Um, and, and to some extent, I think that made us uh, more willing to look into the detail of it because it wasn't as if the Bah Bahamian courts had any particular local advantage in looking into the transactions conducted largely in Ecuador. Um, there's also the Bank of Curacao involved, I think. So it was a very sort of international thing. Um, and the other thing, although, as you say, it was an exception to the normal rule that we don't um, interfere with concurrent findings of fact, the, the facts were very complex. It wasn't, it wasn't a sort of case which turns on the, tr the trial judge or the jury's assessment of the witnesses where one would obviously be very reluctant to interfere with that, particularly where the Court of Appeal, the local Court of Appeal has upheld it. But here you have very complex facts and mainly documented and one really needs to go through them in some detail to work out what actually is going on and to find that in fact, um, as you say, the nominee director uh, was not merely not giving any attention to it, but then no one else was. And in fact, there was some quite sharp practices going on behind the scenes, which were effectively um, covered up by a rather complex chain of events. So I think it's, um, it's probably, I don't think it should give the thought of giving much comfort to people who want to start in trying to get the Privy Council to interfere with concurrent findings of fact in simpler cases. Um, as you say, it's a remarkable judgment of Lord Mance, who goes through the detail of the evidence in enormous care. Um, 
Um, so thank you for that. I don't know, Rowan, you didn't want to say anything about that, did you? Or? Well, I did. I did. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Only because um, um, we've got uh, a question here about, and I, it may be that my lord, you, you answered that as it were through um, what you've just uh, said there. But, but the, the issue of concurrent findings of fact and the board's approach to concurrent findings of fact, and what we really mean by that, because it, it's something I think we're going to address in a bit more detail in the next session. Um, on practice and procedure and tips and tactics for presenting your case in a way that perhaps uh, uh, tries to get around these things. But I just thought um, we have been asked what it is about can that I, can, I, can I explain that a little bit? I mean, the, the actual principle which, the, which Lord Mads describes is it's one of those rare cases where an appellate court, either because the reasons were given by the trial judge weren't satisfactory, or yes. because it unmistakably appears from the evidence that he has not taken proper advantage of having seen or heard the witnesses. So it becomes a matter at large before the appellate court. So pausing for a moment, that was a formulation, by the way, from the House of Law, uh, Supreme Court in, in, in an earlier case. But you can see that that is a very high hurdle for someone to overcome. Effectively, what Lord Mance was saying is that the trial judge hadn't had, I'm afraid to say, misanalyzed the case to such a degree that he hadn't satisfactorily taken proper advantage of having heard and seen witnesses. Now, that is obviously going to be a rare case. And indeed, the length of the judgment indicates precisely that, that it's going to be a very complicated case for the appellate court, the board in this case, to feel that it's at large for them to adopt it. So having, like I think anyone who does privy council work, being um, subject to the strictures of um, concurrent findings of fact, um, this, this, this case does not provide any um, clear path for people who want to say, I want to appeal the fact that I was disbelieved on, on, on my evidence. Yes. I think, I think the other case, I'm just going to give a citation. Here's a case called Cleary, C-L-E-A-R-E, -E, against the Attorney General, 2017, UK PC 38. That's a case I did with um, um, someone from Free Hair Court, all about findings of fact in relation to whether the, whether our client was beaten up in prison by the police. And we did succeed there to overturn concurrent findings of fact on the basis that the trial judge hadn't properly dealt with all of the medical evidence. So overlooking or, or misappreciation, as Richard says, of, of some piece of um, important uh, documentary evidence, you, you may also get home in, in that way. But certainly you need to take advice and uh, think very carefully about how you present a case to the Privy Council in dealing with those sorts of uh, concurrent findings. Yes, I'm sure that's right. You need to be able to point to some specific part of the evidence or aspect which simply hasn't been taken properly into account. Um, sorry, I'm being asked, sorry to keep interrupting, sorry, I'm being asked to repeat the citation for the clear. It's 2017, 2017 UK PC 38. Sorry, uh, Lord Con. No, that's fine. Right, well, I think we've had a very, um, very useful discussion of those cases. Um, I don't think there's any more questions being asked and I don't have any, so, do either of you want to add anything to what's been said? Not in my case. No. Rowan? No, I think things are, are sufficiently clear. About, about, I mean, there, <laughs> there's lots more that could be said about the reflective loss principle when it, yes. doesn't, it doesn't apply, but um, I think people will have to apply in writing. <laughs> <laughs> but they certainly show the variety of cases which one finds the Privy Council having to deal with, a very interesting range. So thank you both very much indeed, and thank you for all our listeners. And we, we, we've got another one coming up. When is it? I can't remember. In, in January, is it? January the 20th, I think. Yes. And that one will be good to come to tune. There'll be tip, lots of tips and tactics from um, our very own Maud Cobb about, <laughs> um, about how to succeed in the Privy Council. I see. Right? Okay. Well, <laughs> we look forward to that. Uh, thank you all very much, and we will finish there. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you very much.